And now in the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. I do want to thank you for this wonderful invitation to spend this morning with you and uh, to be here. And I, I thank your rector and all of those who made, made this possible. Um, I think uh, Bill told me Joyce was working on this three years ago. Um, I was the Bishop of North Carolina and didn't know I was gonna change jobs. <laughs> but I really am delighted to be with you. And I thank Bishop Gibbs who has also helped make this possible and, and your clergy and the leadership of, of this wonderful congregation. So Bill and Joyce and Manisha, wherever they are, I see Bill, but I'm not sure where Joyce and Manisha are, but they're here and I, well, there she is. <laughs> it's good. It really is a joy for me to be with you and to thank you um, for the many ways that, that you serve this world in the name of Jesus to help this world um, resemble something closer to God's dream and farther away from a human nightmare. And so I thank you for the manifold ways that you do that. And I know that the rector is gonna say a little bit about that at the announcement time. And so I'm just, I am thankful to be here and I'm glad to be here and I bring you greetings from um, uh, your fellow Episcopalians in the Episcopal Church gathered together in 16 other countries. And um, they all say hello, they, well, they didn't say it, but I'm saying it for them. <laughs> but it really is a joy to be with you this morning. I hope you're glad to be here. Turn and take your neighbor, I am glad to be here. Tell them. That's right. It's good to be here. And I got to tell you, it's good to be here. I got to hear the choir, your choir yesterday, and they are extraordinary. And um, so I feel like I've gone to heaven two days in a row. <laughs> Allow me, if you will, to offer um, as a text a passage from Galatians where St. Paul has written, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. There is no longer Jew or Greek. No longer slave or free, no longer male or female, no longer Republican or Democrat, <laughs> no, no longer rich or poor, no longer gay or straight, no longer old or young, no longer urban or suburban, no longer American or anything else, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. There's no song based on that passage, some of you may remember it, that says, join hands, disciples of the faith, whate'er your race may be, who serves my father as his child is surely kin to me. In Christ there is no east, no west. In him no south, no north, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide earth. I'd like to say, that we who have been baptized have been baptized not simply into membership in the church, though that's part of it. We've been baptized, we've been baptized into the Jesus movement. The movement that God catalyzed when John the Baptist baptized Jesus at the Jordan River. And every one of us who has been baptized have been baptized into that movement. The movement of God's love in this world. The movement of prophets and sages and patriarchs and matriarchs. The movement of Jesus to change this world and to change us from being merely the human race into the human family of God. Anybody here been baptized? Yeah. You didn't know it. 
You might have been a baby, but you were getting baptized into a movement. The Jesus movement. Just turn and tell your neighbor, guess what? We're in the Jesus movement. Go, turn, turn and tell them. We're in the Jesus movement. It, it has occurred to me that, that um, you know, that God came into the world in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And the more I've looked at this and the more I think about it, I think this is true. I think I'm on target. That he really came for one reason alone, I think. The word reconciliation might get at it. He came to show us the way to be right and reconciled with the God and the creator of all of us and to show us the way to be right and reconciled with each other as children of that one God who has created all of us. And in so doing, Jesus has shown us in his teachings, in the spirit of his life, how to be more than merely the human race. That is not good enough. We can do better than that. Now, uh, you just got quiet, got Episcopalian on me, sorry, I know I gotta, <laughs> let, let me unpack that a little bit. Um, <laughs> think about it. it, you know, being a member, forgive me for what I'm about to say, but being a member of the human race is not that much of an accomplishment. <laughs> I, it, it's a good thing, it's right, I mean, it, it's a point of departure, but it's really not an accomplishment. You didn't do anything, you just showed up, right? right? Um, and, and, and the truth is, I mean, I, I remember, you remember reading that, that uh, short story by Kafka about this guy who went to bed, I remember he went to bed a human being and then woke up a cockroach or some kind of insect, uh, I think it was metamorphosis or something like that. Well, I'd, I'd like to keep waking up a human being and not a cockroach, but the truth is, being a human being isn't that much, it's not an accomplishment at all when you really think about it. Um, it's a good thing. It is a point of departure. We thank God for it, but it's not an accomplishment. Because when you think about it, being a member of the human race is just a matter of biology, right? I mean, think about it. I mean, we are part of the animal world. Um, or when I was in school, he's called the animal kingdom, but part of the animal world. Um, and, and with other animals, we share certain salient characteristics that are part of our biological um, composition. Um, that among many, um, there are some characteristics of, of animals, if you will. Um, they, they eat, they breathe, and they reproduce, right? Respiration consumption. Right? And reproduction. That's what we do. We have two cats at home who can do that. <laughs> well, actually, they can do two out of the three. They've been to the vet. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, you see what I mean? It's just basic biology. That's not that much of an accomplishment, right? It's a good thing, but that's all it is. It's a point of departure. Um, and, and you know, when you really think about it, um, Jesus was actually telling us in a variety of ways that he had come to show us how to be more than merely human beings, more than merely members of the human race, that he was coming into the world to show us how to become more than human. Did he not say, is not life more than food? The body more than clothing? Of course you need food. Of course you need clothing. But life is about more than that. Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field, the birds of the air. Are you not of more value than even those priceless children of God? Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and not bargain basement life, not life to be sold and bought. I've come that you might have life in its fullness and that because you live, you can help others to live and my world to live. You weren't put here just to consume oxygen. You were put here to change the face of the earth. No. Jesus came to show us the way to be right and reconciled with the God who made us and right and reconciled with each other as the children of God. And in so doing, now I'm gonna come to the point now. And in so doing, 
he was teaching us how to become more than merely the human race. He was teaching us how to become the human family of God. And in that is our hope. In that is salvation. In that is life. And we are the Jesus movement. No, we are the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement. <laughs> Get that right. And our charge is to help the world to become the human family of God. Now, you may somebody say, now this sounds good, preacher, but back it up. Show us how we know you're not making this up. Well, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> You, if you look at the Bible, at the sweep, the grand sweep of the Bible, you will notice a pattern in God's behavior, um, both in the Hebrew scriptures and then in the Christian New Testament. But you'll notice there is this consistent pattern on God's part of trying to call the human community closer to himself. You can see it a little bit, for example, in Genesis chapter, chapter 12, where God calls Abraham and Sarah um, and, and tells Abraham and Sarah, he says, look, I want I want you to leave your home in the Tigris Euphrates Valley. I want you to leave your home and your kindred. I want you to leave everything you know and I want you to go to a land not your own, to a people not your own. For those who curse you I will curse, those who bless you I will bless. And then Genesis adds this, for in you or through you I will bless all the families of the earth. Not just some of them all the families of the earth. And Abraham is the ancestor of Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Do you think that's an accident? God's trying to tell us something. Religion is not meant to divide us. It is not meant to destroy us. Religion that is of God is meant to unite us show us how to be more than simply the human race. That's not enough. To show us how to become the human family of God in all of our variety, in all of our diversity, in the wondrous tapestry of God. But if you still don't, if you don't believe Abraham and Sarah, try Jesus. You figure he ought to answer it, right? <laughs> In this morning's gospel, you can sense some of that passionate desire of God to bring us together beyond our divisions, beyond our unenlightened self-interest. Jesus at Jerusalem as he's nearing the cross, Jesus is frustrated. And, and listen to what he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of peace. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to him. How often have I desired to gather your children as a hen gathers her brood. He compares God to a mother hen trying to gather her wayward chicks her Republican chicks and her Democrat chicks, right? Her traditional and progressive, her left-wing and right-wing, her old and young, her black and white, her Protestant, Catholic, Jew, Muslim, is all of her chicks because they're not just the human race. God made us to be God's human family, to care for each other and to care for this world. And that's what Jesus came to show us. And he started a movement to help us do it. And we are the Episcopal branch. <laughs> you knew I was going to get back to that. <laughs> we are the Episcopal branch of that Jesus movement. Now, you can see this. It's, it's writ large all over scripture. Uh, but let me give you one other example, and then I'll sit down. Uh, unless I'm inspired. But no, just one. Just one. <laughs> 
if you remember, and this is it's a fascinating one, and Jesus, um, in Jesus, in the 19th chapter of John's gospel, when Jesus is dying on the cross, um, he's, it's during the crucifixion, um, and there's this moment um, where Jesus is on the cross, he clearly is in the process of dying. Remember, he had made a decision to sacrifice, to give up his own life. He made the decision to do that, to show us what love looks like. I mean, to help us to see what love looks like and how it can change our lives in this world. And he's, he's, you can imagine sweat and, and blood pouring down from his eyes and he can kind of, from his head, and he kind of looks through the sweat and the blood and he sees his mother. And he realizes there's no social safety net. No such thing as social security. No such thing as a pension. And we presume Joseph, her husband, had gone on to glory. And he looks down and he sees his mama. And he sees one of his disciples standing near her. The only male disciple who was there, the other, the brothers had disappeared. Jesus was wise enough to have women disciples. <laughs> he had been by himself on that cross. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, he looks down and he sees his mother and the disciple whom he loved. And he says to his mother, woman, and then looking over at the disciple, behold your son. Not me now. Look, that's your son. And he says to the disciple, behold your mother. And John's gospel says the disciple took her into his own home from that hour. And when he had done that, Jesus just said, I thirst. And having done that, he said, it is finished. It is accomplished. That was the work I came to do to help them create God's human family, born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, but of God. Join hands, disciples of the faith, whatever your race may be, who serves my father as his child is surely kin to me. Oh, let the word hear it, the world know that there was an amen in Christ Church Cranbrook. <laughs> <laughs> and I gotta tell you, there really is power here. And let me, I'll sit down in a second, but let me. Um, <laughs> But your rector told me he gave you some extra time. This is an earlier service. We're a little bit early, so we have extra time, right? That's what you told me. That's what he said. <laughs> when I was getting ready to go off to college, um, I was, um, I think I was in, my, in the car with my father, and, um, and my father was, a, it was an Episcopal priest, and, and uh, we were going somewhere. And, and he said, uh, you know, when you go on to school, I want you to remember one thing. And I was doing what? what are you, 17 or something when you go to college? I probably was rolling my head, but rolling my eyes. I'm 62 now, but I still remember this conversation. Anyway, he said, I want you to remember one thing when you go off to school. And I probably said something like, yes, what is that? Um, he said, you treat every girl the way you want somebody else to treat your sister. And I, I actually remember thinking, you know, you have just ruined four years of college. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had plans. You know, he wasn't going to be around. Grandma wasn't going to be around. This kid was free. Anyway, yeah, but I knew what he meant. He used to say that when we were kids. You treat every girl the way you want somebody else to treat your sister because that girl is your sister. Treat every boy the way you want somebody else to treat your brother because he is your brother. Treat every woman like she is your mother because she is. Every man like he is your father because he is. Treat them the way you want members of your own family to be loved and cared for and respected. Or as Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Create social policies that do that for all of God's children. Create a world that does that for all of us. Find a way to lay down those swords and shields down by that riverside and study war no more. Now, 
And when we do that, we will discover that there actually is plenty room for all of us. And we'll discover that there is a world where all of us are cherished and all of us are loved and all of us set free. A few years ago, I was on summer vacation and came across a book by a photographer named Norman Gershom. Um, I had not heard of him, I heard, heard it on the radio. And so I got the book, the title of the book was God's House. And it was the story of um, the Muslims of Albania during the Second World War. During a time when, when darkness descended on the face of the planet in the form of fascism and bigotry and hatred and genocidal madness, pure evil. The Second World War. As Europe was slowly being conquered by armies of the Third Reich, as civilization was in danger of, exist, of extinction. The German army sent advance word as it approached Albania that they were to gather all of the names and the addresses of Albanian Jews. It just so happened that the foreign minister who received this request was a Muslim. He received the request, and like Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad, he organized an underground network in the Muslim community of Albania. And he sent word to that community that said, and I quote, the Jewish children will sleep with your children. They will eat your food they will stay in your homes. They will live and be your family. And the Muslims of Albania saved 2,000 Jews from the Holocaust. We are more than simply the human race. God, us, God made us to become the human family of God. That means, my brothers and sisters, guess what? I'm your brother. <laughs> and we may be dysfunctional, <laughs> but doggone it, we are family. And we are the Episcopal branch. <laughs> you knew I was getting back to that. We are the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement to help the human race become the human family of God, to create a world where no child will ever go to bed hungry again, to create a world where there is education and opportunity for all of God's children, create a world where there is room and space for all of us to grow and to be, to create a world where, where this planet is saved from itself, to create a world where we really do learn to lay down those swords and shields, not only on the battlefields of literal battle, but the swords and shields of animosity and hatred between us, to lay down those swords and shields down by the riverside and study war no more. So join hands, disciples of the faith, whatever your race may be, whatever your politics may be, who serves my father as his child is surely kin to me, because in Christ there is no east nor west. In him no south, no north, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide earth. God love you, God bless you, and may God hold us all in those almighty hands.